I want to start by saying that I'm extremely terrified to make a video with my opinions on the relationship of two characters that don't exist. But being that that is the reason why I left the fandom, I see this as a way for me to have closure. I don't intend to make anyone feel bad about liking Bumblebee. I don't intend to make anyone dislike Bumblebee. I wish I could still enjoy it. Believe me, I do. I have spent a lot of money on B-themed clothes, Funko Pops, games and mangas. I went to Austin because I fucking love Bumblebee. I cosplayed both Jang and Blake, met Barb and Erin, made an incorrect quotes account, met my fiance thanks to said account. I just really think that the relationship is beautiful, but I just can't enjoy it anymore. So if you love these two dogs, love them a little extra for me, please. So then what made me want to make this video if I love them so much I was willing to go bankrupt for a fictional relationship? Remember I mentioned an incorrect account? Well, at its peak it had a decent amount of followers and that meant that I had to choose my words carefully for everything I tweeted. I almost never gave my honest opinion on things, trying to keep it very positive. It was really stressful. And the first time I criticized Ruby was when I complained about Maria not having a Mexican BA, and that didn't really go well. Interesting reaction. But what does it mean? Side note, thank you Thomas for letting me vent in your video. And the second Listen, I don't know why my small raccoon brain thought it was a good idea to softly criticize how Ruby's taking so long to make them canon, but I did. And it felt good. <laughs> Later, after talking to some friends in the Bumblebee fandom, I realized how scared everyone is to speak negatively about the ship. So why did I tweet that if I was aware how badly it would be received? Let's go back six years. The year is 2016, 3rd of March. The Klexa fandom tune scene live however they can to watch the episode that the showrunner Jason Rothenberg have hyped up so much. And after confessing their love for each other and making love, Alexa dies in Clark's arms. I would like to make a video dedicated to this whole situation later, but in short, the Klexa fandom became outraged over the way the writers and crew of the 100 queerbaited them and the use of the barrier gaze trope. And so for weeks, the trending words on Twitter were And I will give the world to you Klexa deserved better. Klexa deserved better. <laughs> That experience will stick to me forever. The way the fandom stood their ground, screaming that we deserve to see ourselves represented and have happy endings just like everyone else is. It shaped the way that I see and interact with media. And so I felt like I had to speak up. At least for myself to remember that we do in fact deserve better than crumbs and have fast confirmations with no substance. And by the end of volume 7, I had alarms blasting full force in my head. I know what some of you are thinking. Am I implying that Bumblebee is queer baiting? Mm, not really. Uh, however, I think Bumblebee is cake. Let's say you're invited to a party where you're promised the tastiest of cakes. Then you arrive and there's no cake. But the host tells you that if you stick around, maybe there could be a small possibility that there could be cake. But there never is. That's queer baiting. Now, Bumblebee would be more like being invited to a party where they also promise cake. But this time you're looking at a beautiful black and yellow cake in the middle of the room. However, you're not allowed to eat the cake yet. The hosts are telling you all about how good it is. And if you stick around longer, you will definitely get a slice. And you know what? Some people really want cake. When shows like The Owl House, Shira, Arcane, and even Our Flag Means that are giving us representation we've been waiting from Ruby for 8 years in 2, and those shows have the names of Disney and DreamWorks stamped on them, both known for their censorships and first openly gay characters. It makes you wonder, why is it so hard for Rooster Teeth to just give us the cake instead of selling us expensive ass hoodies with changed descriptions and comics that casual viewers aren't gonna read and maybe don't even know about? Some of you must be thinking, hey you! It's unrealistic that Blake and Yang would get together when all of the wild events from the plot are happening and to that I would like to point you to gems like this. Well, Turner, you take me to be your wife. In sickness and in health. With health being left lightly. Look, the true 
this, Blake and Yang are fictional characters. They don't have the power to decide when they get together. The writers do. They could have made Blake and Yang have a conversation about their issues in Volume 6, but they didn't. Instead, they gave that development to the ship where one of them is dead. Oh wait! The writers did write conflict between two characters, putting emphasis on said conflict when they had to part ways and had them have a conversation about their feelings? Oh! So basically, they created nonsense with Renora instead of focusing on conflicts they built up for Blake and Yang that they had already established since Volume 3. Said conflict has only been resolved off-screen with Blake not apologizing on screen where it would matter to the viewer. We're left to speculate on when they had their conversation, but Ren gets to apologize and even say he loves Nora, and no, holding hands and saying we're protecting each other is not a substitute for an apology, Blake. This isn't to say that Ren and Nora don't deserve to have a storyline of their own, but when you, once again, prioritize characters in the B team of the show, I'm gonna start to question why the damn show isn't called Juniper. I'm making it sound like I hated Volume 6, but that's not the case. I think that was when my interest in Ruby was at its peak. I loved it. It was in Volume 7 when I first started to notice that something was off. I'm sure most of us expected something to come out of the revelation of Adam's scar plus Blake's storyline with the White Fang and her finally going to Atlas, and whatever that was gonna be would include Yang. Surprise, nothing happened. The beast killing Adam didn't push their plots forward, it just ended it. They were pushed to the background while Juniper again got to develop. Even John, who wasn't as active in Volume 7. In Volume 8, Yang showed a little bit of initiative and took a decision for herself. Blake, on the other hand, separated from Yang for no reason, and they didn't have any conversation about splitting up again. And Blake doesn't really say much this volume. My girlfriend and I had a little game because of that. The rules being, if Blake says a whole sentence that does not consist of exposition or comedic relief, then it was a good episode. And it happened maybe once or twice. Did Penny just figure that out before you did? We're trapped. It's a trap! Another thing I don't want to do ever again. She's in bad shape. Salem's monster is making Grimm faster than the Atlas military can kill them. We've got to be able to defend ourselves. Even when they reunite, Blake doesn't say anything. It's like she got paid to not express her feelings through words. Listen, I know. I know a show is supposed to be more than a ship, but there is a reason why ships are such a huge part of fandoms. Because we love the characters, and we love their interactions, we love their relationships. These relationships show us why we should care about them. They make us relate and feel connected to them. Yes, a lot of people ship characters just for the hell of it because shipping is fun, man. However, there are ships that we hang on to because, like I said, we relate to them, to their struggles and achievements, and yes, there are gay movies, shows with gay people in them, some of which I love and adore. However, most of them are really not written for us. They're written for a straight audience, and me as a non-binary gay, I'm extremely aware that homophobia and transphobia are a thing, dude. Sometimes I just want to see a character with my sexuality dance with a witch from another dimension. Bumblebee is a great example of what I'm talking about. Two badass protagonists with complementary personalities and struggles, perfectly setting up the perfect amount of angst. So much potential, and yet they just decided that it was too hard and focused on new characters and plot lines, then casted them aside for two whole volumes. This is the supposed canon couple between the bee and Ruby. I say supposed because we've seen them hug and touch foreheads, but at the same time, we haven't had a scene that tells the audience that they're finally in a relationship. And with that, I don't necessarily mean that they have to kiss for them to be canon. They have not talked about their feelings for each other, towards each other. Everything is just implied. Even them holding hands in volume 6 was more a way of saying, I'm here, we can do this together. Which was wonderful, don't get me wrong, but it was more so done to make up for the lack of scene where they can develop as people through the power of talking. It doesn't help that they keep separating them. They don't let them have a conversation about how they're feeling, they don't let them properly process Adam's death, besides that weird conversation in volume 7. It seems that they think all they need to do is make cute moments of them together, and that's gonna be enough. 
when really the main reason why people were invested in them getting reunited after two volumes was to see them talk about what happened in Vegan, about the way it made Yang feel when Blake left. But now, nah. No. <laughs> they don't seem interested in giving that to us. That's fine. But I don't have to like it. Anyways, enough of me complaining. Let's talk about cereal instead. Now for the first time ever, it's a marshmallow inside a marshmallow. The stars and the balloons. Wow. Delicious. It's the magical part of a complete breakfast. New in specially marked boxes of Lucky Charms. Ciao all, Unicorn of War here, and thank you so much to Blake for having me. I'm here to talk about gay shit. Well, actually, I'm here largely to talk about the issues with Ruby's portrayal of male queerness. Given while I'm non-binary, I was also assigned male at birth. That means we'll be tackling Pilot Boy, Scarlet, and Lucky Charms. God give me strength. So let's start with a simple premise. For representation to matter, it must be explicit. It must be clear to the audience that the characters are queer, by which I mean any shade of LGBTQ, whether that audience be themselves queer or cishet. Those who don't know, cishet is an easy catch-all, meaning those who are heterosexual, straight, and cisgender, meaning they identify as the gender they were assigned at birth, not trans. Blake's already discussed this in regards to the queer women of the show, but this issue exists with the men as well, and probably would also fail with the NBs if they tried. Scarlet David has been confirmed as a gay man, but this rings hollow given Scarlet in general is a non-character. He's a member of Sun's team who, along with Sage, gets hardly any screen time, and has no actual presence in the story. The most he gets is a slight presence in the supplemental novel Before the Dawn, which I admittedly have not read and have no intention to read. I shouldn't need supplemental material to get crucial information, let alone meaningful representation. As for his gayness, it was only confirmed in the Red Like Roses anthology, another piece of supplemental material, through a joke. Scarlet just quickly says he's not into girls, and Ruby, who's been hoping to be introduced to boys, is told to keep looking as sparkles float around Scarlet. Annoying sparkles aside, Scarlet doesn't even use the word gay or say he's into men. We're just left to interpret this as him admitting his sexuality, which is never expressed in the actual show. Apparently, they hint towards a romance between him and one of the background nobodies from Volume 3's tournament fights, which... Excuse me? The reason this means so little is because Scarlet, in the grand scheme of the show, doesn't matter. He's a background character whose gayness isn't even found within the main show itself, but merely suggested in supplemental content that a far smaller audience will bother consuming. And given he doesn't seem to explicitly admit his gayness, it still carries a plausible deniability in case the creators want to dodge the potential heat of the situation. It's something very common with gay rep where cishet creators will want to say that they represent queer people for clout, but won't actually put the work into representing them and risk a backlash. We can't alienate the homophobic or reactionary parts of the audience because we need their money. Crow and Clover's situation has attracted a lot of criticism in polarity itself, with people debating as to whether it reads as a platonic bromance or a potential romantic relationship. I covered this more in my older video on the Lucky Charms debate, but it's a common issue for queer readings where, because representation is so sparse and so much queer representation historically has been subject to censorship, queer audiences have basically learned to read into subtext to see themselves reflected back, while cishet audiences just always know that they'll see people like them in any media they consume without even having to think twice about it. The mishandling in the writing itself, along with Kruby's general social media presence and parasocial dynamics with the fandom, has led to a complete dumpster fire, where those who expected to see representation were instead traumatized and left cynical. A rude awakening to the idea that maybe Ruby's queer representation isn't as stellar as we might have hoped. Is that a shot of my past self? Yes, yes it is. Raise your standards, get better role models. Pilot Boy really cements this problem, though. In case you don't recall, Pilot Boy is that pilot from Volumes 4 and 5 who tried to take Weiss to Mistral, only to die off-screen in the airship crash after they were attacked by Lancers. 
Originally, Pilot Boy was meant to be the first explicitly gay character in the show through a picture of himself, his husband, and their kids. And this was partially meant to suggest more gay rep later on with Ilya's confession to Blake. However, other members of Kruby came to Miles and Carrie, specifically Miles, and told them that it wasn't a great idea. This is because queer characters tend to die more often than their cishead counterparts. Because there are fewer of us, it matters more when we see even one of us on screen. But because of that, it also means something bad happening to us hits harder. The one time you actually got to be part of a story just like everyone else, it was only to meet a tragic end. So Ruby's first gay character being a nameless extra who dies off screen... Not great. But Miles later on said that he wished he stuck to his guns given Pilot Boy became such a fan favorite. It seems the entire issue of having your first confirmed queer character die just flew right over the writers' heads. I'm not saying it's malicious intent, though quite frankly that does not matter as much as the impact, and the impact is not good. It's clear that the writers care more about looking progressive and accepting rather than actually putting the work in to represent queer people in any meaningful way, probably to avoid stepping on the toes of parts of their audiences who seem to have a knee-jerk reaction to anything that seems even remotely gay or progressive. I mean, why else would they refuse to say the word gay when it came to Scarlet, when it comes to Bumblebee? Um, in case any of y'all didn't get the memo or didn't watch Kipo, uh, which you should, Kipo's great, you can say the word gay. You can have characters just come out and say that they're gay. With all that said, back to you, Blake. Cole is entitled, but I do think we deserve better from a show that keeps flaunting their LGBT representation but can't even show us an explicit kiss between two women that have a child together. We deserve better than JPEG gays and gays in DOCs that you have to know about. We deserve better than poorly marketed beings and songs that tell a much better queer story than eight years worth of a show that's filled with promises of better representation. I sincerely hope, for everyone who's still sticking around with Ruby and every newborn beat, that Bumblebee becomes canon soon. Hopefully in volume 9. I want people to comment under this video that Bumblebee is finally canon, after so many years of mishandling these amazing characters that they have at their disposal. As for me, I'm done waiting for the cake when I have a whole ass bakery next door. <laughs>